Okay, let's get started. I just want to welcome everyone on behalf of the law school. Um, we are delighted to have today with us Director General uh, Rafael Mariano Grossi, Director General of the IAEA, of course, uh, who is a, a diplomat with 35 years plus experience in the international community, an Argentine diplomat, who served in many roles on behalf of Argentina and now, of course, leads uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency and has done so since 2019. And his biography is so long and distinguished that it would take most of our time together for me to go through it. So I will, I will let him add whatever he wishes about his background that you, wish, that you think is relevant, Director General. But I think we should get to the meat of your presentation. And um, what Mr. Grossi has said, Director General, said he'd like to speak to is his um, long experience in non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, but also the relevance of his role and nuclear energy and climate change uh, and some other things that um, you will touch on. So let me turn it to you and once um, the Director General is done, we'll have a Q&A session which I'll moderate. So um, feel free to uh, develop some questions, think of some questions and we'll have a great discussion. Welcome. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to, to be with you today um, to discuss uh, what we are doing. I suppose for those uh, following uh, some of the international issues and matters we are dealing with, uh, there would be a keen interest on all its topics. But uh, let me try to give you a little bit of a uh, mix of where we stand on some of the uh, ongoing situations, crises, uh, and also, but also uh, at the same time. Uh, some information on things we, we do, you, you, you might perhaps not be so familiar. And of course, at the end, uh, the, well, the most uh, important, uh, always interesting, uh, is to talk, to listen to you, comments, questions, criticism, uh, anything. So, uh, uh, IEA is, um, is an organization that uh, has uh, as its competencies uh, a mix uh, of things that have to do with its role as the nuclear watchdog in the world. Uh, and here, what we have in mind is, is the, the work and the uh, tribulations and the issues we have with, uh, with uh, Iran, with uh, North Korea. Uh, in the past with Iraq, or Syria, or L Libya. I was not DG at the time, but uh, the institution. Some of which are ongoing, and some of which are, uh, some, some of these issues are perhaps in, uh, um, in development. Uh, people talk about uh, future hotspots for non-proliferation, where this could be what would happen in the Gulf and in other places. Uh, of course, very importantly um, and, and quite uh, related to the realities of the day is how we have been propelled quite unexpectedly, I should say, into the war in Ukraine because of our nuclear safety uh, responsibilities and competences, which uh, led me to uh, get involved early on in the conflict, in um, the war, going there, uh, crossing the front line many times, and um, establishing a form of uh, international presence at the occupied uh, nuclear power plant in Saporizia, where we are trying to avoid uh, a nuclear accident there by virtue of the, uh, of the military conflict, uh, which, which is ongoing. So perhaps we can go into that if you're interested, what, what's happening, what we are trying to do, how we go about it uh, at a time of, of war, what is the space that an international organization may have in a situation uh, like this. I also, of 
course, mentioned uh, Iran and the mm, permanent uh, concerns that linger on for many, many years now on the possibility that Iran may cross the line, just as uh, the People's Republic, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, did it back in 2006, after many diplomatic attempts of trying to prevent them from proliferating, from getting a nuclear weapon, they did. And so, uh, and, uh, and all of this against the, the backdrop of a, uh, always convulsed Middle East. Um, and what is the IEA doing and, and in trying to prevent this uh, from, from happening? Uh, uh, likewise, uh, always on the, if you want, the strategic part of the agenda, uh, evolving situations like in the Indo-Pacific with the possible introduction of a nuclear naval uh, propulsion by Australia in the context of the AUKUS uh, project, where the IEA would have, will have, a very important uh, role to play in order to prevent this uh, project from uh, being a focus of proliferation. Uh, this has caused um, a, um, I would say, very strong pushback from China and other countries in the region, in particular China. And we have now uh, at the IEEA uh, hot uh, political debates uh, on the role of the agency, the competencies of the agency, whether this would be happening or should be happening or not, and what is going to be the consequence uh, of, uh, of this. There are other um, uh, uh, issues and topics where the non-proliferation factor is increasingly important, like, for example, Saudi Arabia, the possibility that Saudi Arabia would develop nuclear energy and the consequences of that, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, an area, uh, a cluster, if you want, of uh, themes and issues where uh, the IEA has uh, a role, as I will say, as the nuclear, as a nuclear watchdog. But there are uh, other uh, important things uh, that um, uh, are at the center of the IEA's uh, work, uh, which are also equally important in the international agenda. By a, by, by a convergence of uh, factors, on the one uh, hand, uh, uh, global warming and climate change, and on the other, the, um, the sudden uh, energy crisis that we are having and seeing uh, in particular in, cent in Central and Eastern Europe, but in other parts of the world as well. There is an obvious regain of interest in nuclear energy. Um, so, uh, and as you know, nuclear energy has been debated for many years with, with uh, uh, faces of uh, enormous enthusiasm back in the 1970s and early 80s and then after particularly after uh, Chernobyl, uh, a, a pushback, strong pushback in many countries, uh, which when it, it seemed it was um, dwindling, and again with the accident of Fukushima Daiichi, uh, another wave of criticism, and now all of a sudden uh, a lot of interest in nuclear reactors being built uh, in many countries and countries taking decisions or moving away from previous decisions of phasing out uh, nuclear energy. And the appearance on the uh, horizon of uh, the idea of uh, small and modular reactors, new generations of uh, nuclear uh, energy um, uh, facilities and, and projects, uh, fusion, uh, approaching demonstration phase uh, after many, many years of being considered uh, almost a utopian um, uh, scientific curiosity. Um, so all of this 
uh, increases the responsibility, of course, uh, of the IEA, which is the organization that has to make sure that if this happens, it is done in a way which is safe, uh, secure, and not proliferation uh, prone, I would say. Uh, and, and, and also, uh, I, I would like to, to mention something that we were discussing a minute ago uh, before, we, before we started, and it's the work, uh, the very important work that the IEA carries out in areas that you might not be familiar with. For example, the IEA um, is the International Hub for Nuclear Medicine, Oncology and Radiotherapy. So we are uh, equipping uh, countries, training um, oncologists, um, uh, radiologists um, in, in Africa and in many, in many underdeveloped uh, areas uh, of the world. Uh, the same uh, related to food security with nuclear techniques. Uh, the IEA helps countries to develop um, um, drought resistant crops, um, eradicate uh, mosquitoes um, that bring Zika, Chikungunya, Dengue, um, the uh, fruit fly that, uh, that ravages uh, the uh, produce that countries uh, use for their um, economic uh, development. So this is another uh, area where the IEA um, is providing a service to the, to the international community uh, as such. Uh, this week, uh, coming to the end of the week, um, and I'm very happy to be in this uh, uh, calm environment of uh, Harvard and Cambridge after the um, hot and anxious and, uh, uh, New York where I come from just now, uh, after uh, um, having attended the um, uh, high-level segment of the United Nations uh, General Assembly, where I was seeing Russians and Ukrainians and Chinese and all these people having all these conflicting priorities and expectations about what the IEA um, is, is doing. Um, I would... Uh, say in closing these introductory remarks so we can talk about the things that uh, you would like me to address uh, that I would like to say that uh, the, the, the IEA in my opinion uh, is now uh, an interesting case in useful multilateralism. Uh, we, we know and that you I suppose as uh, students uh, uh, of law international law or uh, other branches um, must be familiar with the uh, idea or the concept that uh, international organizations, particularly the United Nations, have not lived up, up to the expectations that they, that under which they were uh, created more than half a century ago. Um, I would challenge that notion with the track record of the IEA, in particular, the past few few years. But I would like to know what you think about this. What What is it that you believe uh, the IEA could be doing, the IEA is not doing, or um, other uh, issues that might be interesting uh, for you? So let me thank you again for for the opportunity to, to talk to you. And uh, let's move on to the to the real fun of this, which is to uh, interact, to listen to you, and to answer to your questions. Thank you. So I'm happy to moderate. Let me just say, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and saying your affiliation at Harvard and um, asking a question rather than perhaps making a statement. We want to give a chance to everybody to ask a question. So if you could do that, we'd appreciate it. So, yes. Um, and you know what, we have little mics. Yes, you yes. Just, it would help folks, yeah. All right, um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, this is fascinating. Uh, my name is Damien. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in chemical physics. Yeah. Um, my question has to do with um, the latter part of, uh, of your talk about multilateralism. 
Um, it seems like the IAEA, through you know the nuclear power delegations, is probably one of the last places currently where there is conversation happening between Russians and, and the West, Americans in particular. I think, for example, the, the U.S. part in like Arctic Council has you know stopped collaborating with the Russian side, for example. So, on on your end of things at the IAEA, how are those conversations happening? Is there positive dialogue? Well, um, of course, uh, yeah, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you, you are right. Uh, not only the IEA is one of the last places where there is interaction uh, between um, uh, Russia and, and the rest, although there is sometimes there are, there's pushback, there are difficult, very difficult uh, situations that we are having, uh, but also very tense uh, between China and the United States and China and the West in general and, and NATO allies in, in, in general. But um, uh, I, I believe that what, what keeps um, this dialogue uh, ongoing is a shared, um, not um, uh, conviction or, or a coincidence in, in, in values or principles, but the fact that the, uh, the subject matter is uh, indispensable for all. Subject matter cannot be ignored by anybody. Uh, for for uh, Russia, which is the number one vendor in the world of nuclear reactors that depends on nuclear energy, for uh, Europe that, uh, contrary to some conventional wisdom, is very nuclear. People are focused on Germany, but uh, uh, actually in uh, 13 countries of the European Union. There are, there are more than 100 reactors operating right now in, in Europe, and France is doing more, the UK, et cetera, et cetera. So for all of these countries, the, the IEA is the place where they discuss uh, non-proliferation, but not only discuss. This is the, also the important uh, thing that I would like to draw your attention to. Um, we are not just a, uh, a talk shop. The IEA inspects, the IEA sets safety standards, security guidance, things that countries do or must follow or are accountable for. So this makes the, the discussion of the necessity to continue with the discussion uh, indispensable. So this is one um, uh, aspect that uh, that is important and uh, and the one that for example allowed me to move in uh, and in a certain sense impose myself in the war uh, because when uh, the Saporizhia nuclear power plant was occupied by the Russian forces in early March 2022 we could have said well this is a war you know we will wait, it's a disaster, send, issue some tweets from Vienna. Uh, but we said, uh, no, we have uh, an authority and a competence when it comes to nuclear safety and the security of a nuclear power plant. And I don't want to get into it, it took me months. But, but in the end, we were able to go there and to set up. Uh, 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 and, uh, and the fact that, uh, that this is the only operation, you see the grain deal has failed, this is the only operation where uh, Russia and Ukraine tolerate us, we are there, um, uh, we uh, manage to overfly uh, the, the uh, political and, uh, and uh, international law aspects of this situation uh, on the basis of well-established practice uh, of the United Nations, by the way, in cases of uh, occupation. So we have used all these elements that we had to try to uh, go and do the, and do the job. Um, we are not out of, out of the woods yet, so. Sorry, Sorry just a sec, let me, we'll come back to you, but let me get some other people in. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, thank you for, uh, I'm so happy to be here. Um, my name is Dana and I'm uh, affiliated with the Extension School. And I wanted to ask you about um, it's 
pretty known that for many years now, uh, Iran um, has a tendency to. Uh, you hear me? Um, I think I, you should push the mic. No, it's, it's, if you keep, your, keep pressing the mic, it helps everything. Yeah. Oh, it presses the Yeah, that, that, that's perfect, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so it has been known for many years now that um, Iran has the tendency to try to conceal mm -hmm. some stuff um, and try to reach um, a breakthrough um, towards nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. And I know there are um, a lot of inspectors and, um, mm -hmm. and agents of the IAEA over there and, um, in their sites. And also, the last week, it has been reported that a few of the uh, IAEA agents were, um, let's say, yes. And for some like of my inspectors word. have been, you know, taken <laughs> off the list of allowed yeah. inspectors to come. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, how how does the organization deal with that in general, trying to conceal um, developments and trying to conceal stuff in general in Iran? And how do you deal with um, yeah, agents being for, forbidden from entering those sites and the dangers in that? And yeah. Well, um, the, 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 the case of Iran is, is of course, uh, uh, very concerning. Uh, you are right in saying that uh, the track record is quite uh, complex. Uh, Iran has been found in deviation from its uh, um, obligations uh, with the IEA in the past, it has been referred to the UN Security Council, uh, which has sanctioned uh, uh, Iran. Um, and the situation has known a number of um, um, ups and downs. To mention but one, which is the one perhaps informing the present more than anything else, you may know that in 2015 there was an agreement uh, after many, many years of um, negotiations uh, struck by what uh, became known as the P5 plus one, which means that the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany, coordinated by the EU with Iran, uh, which set a number of uh, quite stringent limitations on the, the Iranian nuclear program. And the idea behind that agreement was that this agreement would be the mother of all the agreements because it would really put the, the genie back in the bottle and uh, set uh, a, a, a process which, is, which was seen as a very a long one, into projecting itself into the future, like 20 years and more, so there, there could be a new, um, I would say, um, uh, system of relations between Iran and the rest of the world, all inspected or monitored by the IAEA. But uh, in 2018, uh, um, previous administration, this country decided to withdraw from, from this agreement. And this uh, pushed us into a new uh, crisis, if you want, which in the beginning was slow, but uh, it accelerated itself because Iran uh, started announcing its uh, uh, deliberate and very open, gradual non-compliance with every obligation that was in that agreement until a point came when, where, where, where nothing has been um, complied with. So what we have is like a sort of an empty shell, which is called JCPOA, which exists. Nobody has declared it dead, but uh, it is like dead. So uh, 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 Iran's approach and, and relation with the agency has deteriorated in parallel because we found at the same time we found traces of uranium in many places where we, we shouldn't have which means that there had been secret activities that should have been declared to the agency so that 
uh, that um, uh, took us to uh, uh, again to uh, an area of conflict, and and I've been dealing with this ever since I became director general. I've been to Tehran many times uh, uh, and and uh, talking to them, and always, of course, from my perspective, trying to keep this within diplomatic channels, trying to offer. Uh, viable solutions so that Iran can demonstrate its proclaimed um, um, compliance with international norms and to prove, to say it bluntly, that it's not making nuclear weapons. Uh, but of course, in the current circumstances and with all these difficulties, you were mentioning uh, the, the, the flavor of the month, which is the fact that they decided to uh, to ban uh, a number of inspectors in order to conduct my inspections. I have a list, a roster of inspectors. Um, and they decided to cross out uh, a number of them. Of course, they targeted the very best, as if uh, by chance. Um, so I protested and I went everywhere saying this cannot happen, etc., etc., etc. On my way, uh, to here, I got a call from the Iranian foreign minister saying, well, "Come to my mission in New York and let's discuss this." I mean, I'm in, you know, I'm in Harvard, so we we'll have to wait. <laughs> um, so um, uh, anyway, it is a potentially volatile situation, as you know. Other countries in the region are uh, openly uh, saying that uh, they are ready to take unilateral action if they feel that. The situation in Iran is uh, uh, beyond uh, the, um, uh, the compliance controls of, of the IEA, uh, which of course we are trying to prevent. Uh, but just to mention how uh, uh, complex this issue is, you may have seen that uh, over the past few days there were some um, back channel agreements between the United States government and Islamic Republic of Iran on, on, on prisoners. Um, and in the context of these discussions, some nuclear aspects were also discussed, which I cannot discuss here, but to put you to know that there are these back channels and, and, and conversations, but in a, in a very inarticulated manner, which poses a difficulty for us uh, at, at the agency. This doesn't mean, so I don't want to, to mislead you into believing that the agency is not in Iran. We are still inspecting because we have some uh, authority derived from the safeguards agreement that they have. Uh, but of course, um, it is limited. And what I have said always when Iranians uh, say that they uh, have an inalienable right citing the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 4, that to develop nuclear uh, energy without limitations. I always tell them yes, but of course, um, we have to have an ability to verify what you're doing, which is commensurate with the nuclear program that you have, which is very ambitious, very, very um, um, sophisticated. Iran is enriching uranium at 60% or more. To make a bomb, you need 90%. As the scientists uh, in the room will know. So it's the only country which uh, has, doesn't have nuclear weapons that is doing these things without a, a reason for accumulating all of this material. So uh, um, we, we continue in a, in a very difficult uh, situation. I cannot afford to throw the towel. I must push and push because if I say I have nothing more to say, or uh, the IEA cannot uh, work anymore, then I'm sure that something very bad will happen. So we try to keep our uh, relevance. Uh, um, we try to make uh, Iran uh, be responsive. And this entails a lot of diplomacy, hmm? including with Russia, with China, with countries that you may consider in your analysis as being closer to Tehran than Western countries. In the back. How do you go about um, promoting, or how do you approach promoting the good that nuclear technology can do for societies, people, countries, 
Um, in the face of obviously all this doom and gloom surrounding you know, important issues like nuclear weapons, but also more popular imaginations of the dangers of nuclear technology and energy that are influencing governments in places not the U.S., Germany, elsewhere, yeah. they're shutting down. Well, yes, it's an excellent question. When it, this, this is one of the things where we try to be as pedagogic, transparent, and informative as we can. Although many, many years of uh, narratives that were sometimes completely baseless um, have done a lot of damage, to be honest. A lot of damage. Uh, it happens to me that even in conversations with highly educated people, um, there are certain uh, misconceptions about nuclear energy or nuclear waste. I don't want to get into examples, but I might. Uh, or the effects of uh, uh, radiation or what a nuclear power plant is uh, that has been informed uh, political decisions. And, and this, is a fact of, uh, this is a fact of life. Um, it has happened to me uh, to be in, in open fora like, like, like this, where um, when uh, addressing certain issues, which I like to do because I think you have to, to talk to everybody, and especially those who are in disagreement, uh, when you, you know, addressing uh, Fukushima or what happened there, and when you say that nobody died because of radiation in Fukushima to be laughed at by a room full of people, all right? Like, so there is a, a profound uh, um, uh, ignorance in many places, but of course, uh, one has to educate, one has to explain. One cannot consider, and this has been one of the problems also with the nuclear sector. I have been working, you said, 35 years. Unfortunately, I'm closer to 40 years or more now. Maybe that was written five or six years ago. I've been working in this area all of my life from the diplomatic side. And uh, um, the, the, I've been attending many conferences where where some of the nuclear uh, engineers, et cetera, were saying, well, we don't, we don't have time to explain to people what it is. I mean, they should know, they should understand. It is like this. It, it is like this. It's obvious. Hmm? No, nothing is obvious. One has to go and explain. Let me give you the example of what is going on in Fukushima. You may be following what we are doing. Uh, you know that the Japanese are uh, disposing of uh, one, more than one million tons of water which accumulated after cooling the stricken reactors. And of course, this water, as you know, are, is, is getting some of the radionuclides that are there in the debris of, uh, of the reactors. And then they have to dispose of this water. So in Asia, here is not an issue. But let me tell you, I go to China, to, to South Korea. Um, uh, um, uh, we were, you know, uh, we couldn't, I, I couldn't leave the airport because of demonstrations outside um, uh, China for political reasons. The Pacific Islands, which suffered, suffered in the 70s and 80s and the 60s of the, for, for the open nuclear tests. So for, for these people, very legitimately, the word atomic energy or, or nuclear energy evokes um, all sorts of negative things. So I think the, our responsibility, our effort is aimed at trying to explain. And, and it's not a, um, I would say, um, a thankless task, task. For example, it's very interesting to see that uh, nowadays, for example, in the uh, environmentalist uh, movement, there are, the majority is pro-nuclear. Those who are well informed, they know that nuclear energy is a clean source of energy, that waste, uh, high level uh, radioactive waste, has ways to be managed, and, and so on and so forth. Even in Germany, which is so adamant uh, anti nuclear, at least the present coalition is, uh, already now the polls show that 60% of the population would have preferred that the nuclear reactors are kept because Germany is firing up coal plants with a government that has the Green Party in the So uh, anyway, it's, it, we could discuss for hours, but all, all, I, all I want to say is that 
uh, it, is, it is important to inform. It is, it is very important to work with industry, with, uh, with the regulatory community as well, to, give, to inform, inform parliamentarians. Uh, one thing I've done since I became Director General is to talk a lot to parliaments. Parliamentarians are the ones who approve laws. And nobody's talking to them. Nobody's explaining. And I've seen a lot of interest in, in Europe, in Latin America. I go to, to parliamentarians, and, and uh, they want to know. So I think it's, a, it's an effort. It's not easy. Uh, but uh, I think it is worth the, the effort, really. Hi, um, I'm James, and I'm uh, from the law school here. Um, so a technology that's often compared um, with nuclear technology because of the potential to bring great benefits to society, but also very significant risks um, is artificial intelligence. And um, I know there are a number of papers being written and a number of discussions. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, around the possibility of establishing new international or intergovernmental organisations to, you know, to regulate artificial intelligence and spread the benefits whilst protecting against the harm. So I was wondering, to what extent do you think the IAEA is an um, appropriate kind of model for regulation yeah. of artificial intelligence? Well, uh, your question is so timely. This week I was discussing this. I signed an agreement with the Secretary General of the, Colum of the ITU, the International Telecommunications uh, Union, because they have been um, chosen or, or designated, I don't know, within the family of uh, UN uh, organizations. We are part of the, common, of the UN system, but we are independent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they are a special, what's called in international law, a specialized agency within the UN system. So we are certainly working uh, with, uh, with them. There are two things. One is the use of AI in nuclear, which is a, a, a big topic. And tomorrow, I'm signing with MIT, with your colleagues of MIT, an agreement uh, on uh, co collaborating on, on issues related to uh, artificial intelligence in, in, in nuclear. So that is the scientific part. And there are lots of things in which um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, is being used and, uh, and very useful. Uh, but what people have said, and I was discussing with the Secretary General of the United Nations about this, uh, I think when people talk about the IEA, my impression after these conversations is that they are not thinking too much about nuclear or the, or the science behind what we do, what they like is that we are the only international organization that has some teeth. Not, yeah. not much, but some. All the others is just, you know, they talk. But uh, there's no consequence. We, we, as I was saying, we can send people to the Security Council. We, we have uh, standards, et cetera, et cetera, that have to be complied. So it's a normat, it's a normat standard setting organization. So I think what people have perhaps a bit intuitively brought together is the, this idea of an international body working in a technical domain that has devised a system of control which works. This is my, it's a hunch, I don't know. I cannot prove it, but this is my impression because of course when you talk about, I mean, our uh, safeguards, what you call safeguards, the inspection system, is based on accountability and control of nuclear material. Mm -hmm. Basically, there are other things that are more behavioral, if you want, and could be intangible. But mostly, mostly things, artificial intelligence is, is, is a different thing. But still, we are part of these working groups, and people listen a lot to what we have to say because we. We work with scientists and technologists, and, and we try to. So I believe the IEA will be able to help a lot in this, uh, in this process. But it's vast, as you know. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Hello. My name is Marina. I'm a researcher at the Belfer Center at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm currently working on a research project focused on a Daba nuclear power plant in Egypt uh, wow. that Rosatom, or Russia, is building. Um, the first reactor is supposed to be online in about five years, so 2028. Um, 
And at present, many Egyptian companies are on site in terms of construction, um, civil works, that sort of stuff. But there seems to be some, but maybe not enough, programs focused on training and um, Egyptian nationals to maintain and operate the power plant once it's online. Yes. Um, are you concerned that there will be a stratification of expertise and Russian nationals will maintain a dominant, influential role on site? What needs to be done from an international level or perhaps in Cairo so that Egypt will better will be better positioned to regulate and operate the power plant? Um, could the additional protocol assist? Well, uh, it is uh, uh, a very important issue. The fact that, uh, the, that Egypt is on the verge of becoming a nuclear user is a vast, important development politically uh, in, for, the, for the Middle East, uh, I'm convinced. I've been discussing with President Sisi about this. Um, the issue like to evoke of uh, the, the Egyptian presence or, or Russian dominance, I think here we are mixing two, two things. The, the, whether the, 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 the Russian technology is going to translate itself into some dominant position in the country, I doubt. Uh, I think um, the, uh, the fact that uh, you have a company, could be Westinghouse, or could be EDF from France, or it could be um, Tsubishi, or uh, CNNC from China, does not translate uh, into a political domination position. Of course, it's a, a, a very profound link, because when it comes to nuclear, you are in for a century. And I'm not using a figure of speech. Nuclear reactors are, are approaching 100 years of operation. They are already at 60, 70. So when you get into, into a nuclear project, it means that you are going to be in an, in an interaction with your vendor, most probably, and in particular, if you are a developing country, needing technological. So of course, there is going to be an intensity in their relation, which may or may not translate into other political areas of time. What I can tell you is that and here, my, my condition, which uh, does not exist as, for as long as I'm here in this position, but it can help us academically, my condition of, 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 as an Argentine might help, because Argentina sold uh, a research reactor to Egypt. And I was involved in the diplomatic part of that negotiation. So one thing I can tell you in those negotiations, even if this was a so-called South-South cooperation, Egypt, Argentina, Argentina, Egypt, the, the Egyptians are very keen on developing their own. They are very nationalistic. So they, they are very keen on developing their own capacity. Uh, so um, uh, even though the model, the commercial model, business model that has been adopted is, uh, is uh, the operator is basically building, owning, and operating the site. Um, you, you will not have a Russian in, enclave in Daba. Uh, you will have a few thousand Russians, and perhaps the number will go down. And let me cite the example of Bushir in, in Iran, where, which is the only nuclear power plant that Iran has. It was originally a German nuclear power plant from the times of the Shah that was more or less uh, abandoned, and the Russians took it. Uh, and, and finished it and, and so on. So there were lots of uh, Russians and gradually they have been scaling down uh, their presence. So you have to follow the case, I don't know, uh, uh, and we will be there working uh, so perhaps the IEA will be able to help you in giving you information in the future if you continue with that academic interest. Thank you. In the back there. Um, yeah, you have to hold yeah. Mohamed Salon with the Welfare Center uh, at the Kennedy School as well. I have a follow-up question on Iran. Um, have you been surprised by how fast Iran expanded its nuclear program since 2018? Uh, or do you expect this? No. No? I, mean, you're not I haven't been surprised. Let me elaborate a little bit. 
Uh, not at all, because when you look at Iran, and you are, I suppose, following it or studying it, working on it, you will see uh, even uh, through periods where they, they, they were, for example, applying the additional protocol back in the early 2000s, and then uh, a bad patch through the Ahmadinejad administration, and then uh, uh, Rouhani and, and, and the JCPOA, and now uh, Raizi, and out of it, there has been a great continuity in the program. I think in this, the Iranians have always kept uh, the, the basic things that they wanted to do. At times, they slow down. At times, they speed up. But the, uh, the basic uh, continuity has always uh, been, been there, has been a feature. And when you see it when you see the teams, the people working there, they're always there. They are good friends that you've been working with for many, many years, for those working in Iran. So this is why I said I, I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Okay. Oh. So I'm Lawrence, an LLM from the law school. Uh, could you elaborate more on the release of the water from Fukushima? Because a lot of countries are still complaining that they were not involved in the framework for monitoring the mm -hmm. safety of the water. And in my country, the Philippines, a lot of fishermen are still afraid of the potential effects on the, on the industry. So could you elaborate more? Yes, yes. Well, on this, uh, a little bit of facts first, for those who might not be, uh, well, I, I, I gave some information. 1.3 tons of water, uh, contaminated water. So Japan came up with a plan uh, to uh, dispose of this water. To dispose of water, um, um, which is contaminated, there are a few ways to do it. Uh, basically, uh, the two that are um, or have been used. One is is vaporized. Uh, by the way, that's what that's what happened in Trimal Island here in this country. But it was a tiny amount of uh, water. And the other one, which is the one that is used all over the world, including in the United States, is the disposal of the water as an effluent, as an industrial effluent. You have effluents in many industrial activities containing not only radionuclides, but, but chemicals that could be very harmful. So normally, environmental authorities in our countries uh, make it so that the, the industrial uh, uh, the companies, etc., ha have to process this water in some way so that the levels of any harmful chemical or radionuclide, in this case, must be uh, below a certain level which ensures that there is not going to be a harmful effect on the water, sediment, or the fish. All right? Here, the facts. So Japan came up with a plan. And they decided to uh, do this via a, a cleansing process, which is called ALPS, which would uh, take out most of the iridium localized there. Um, with the exception of one, which is tritium, uh, which will be diluted to levels well below what is authorized by uh, the World Health Organization. So they came with this plan and they came to us. And they said, please, IEA, can you check this plan? Can you tell us whether this plan will be in conformity with the, safety, the nuclear safety standards? So this is what we did. And we came to the conclusion that the plan, if applied in the way that was conceived, would be in conformity with. So here there was an uproar of um, protest and criticism from basically China, also the Republic of Korea, and in your part of the world, some other countries. Indonesia, a little bit, Philippines, they were asking questions, how is it, etc., etc. And I think it, 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 it connects with your question about information and informing people 
what it is all about. So I, I went to Japan, I discussed initially with the, with the late uh, Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, and I told him, listen, this is going to be very controversial. I'm not getting into the politics of this, but the reality is that there is going to be a lot of political manipulation of this thing. People were very afraid, and rightly so, of what happened here. They see, I don't know if you've seen the photos, you see, you see all these tanks full of water, and people say, well, this water is, it's, it's, it's radioactive water, which is going to poison our seas, and etc." And uh, so, uh, of course, that would be very effective. Um, so I told uh, Abe, listen, I, I would propose that you let us be involved as an international organization. Um, um, the plan is OK, but why don't you let us uh, do the, the sampling and the analysis and the evaluation? You have to do it by yourselves because it's a national, it's a national responsibility. And I go here to your the part of your comment when you say, why hasn't the international community? Well, uh, public health is a national competence. So when there is a problem in any country, in your country, let's suppose that, or in my country, in Argentina, or in the Philippines, or uh, it's a national competence. Uh, it, you're not going to call another country, or another country will not have the right to come and say, I want to check it, because there might be a transboundary effect. Transboundary effects are regulated in international law, as you all know, but the uh, enforcement authorities and the environment authorities are always national. And in this case, what I did was propose, and here I go again to effective multilateralism, I went to them and I said, let me do this. Let, let the IEA be involved. You invite me, because it's your competence, it's your national competence. You don't want to be challenged on that. So you invite me, and we will try to do it. And this is what, what, what happened. Uh, so they decided uh, in, in August to start this discharge. So I set up uh, an IEA office at the plant in Fukushima. I went there personally. So we have our own you know, small lab there. So whenever they have a batch that they want to start discharging, we sample before it goes out, and then we go out and, and, and check. And, and, and up to now, what we have seen is that the levels of uh, tritium are it, it's, it's hardly traceable. So this being said, we take, we take all these doubts seriously. When you're a Harvard Law student, you understand. But in some places, even when you explain, people will not understand. Some, it will be for political reasons. And, and, and here you have an egregious case. And some will still be afraid. And I went, I went to Fiji. I went to Cook Highlands. Uh, I met with the communities. Uh, it's not common that the head of an international organization does that. But I felt I, I had to do it to answer questions. Uh, I don't know to what extent we convinced them, but I think that there is a commencement of a dialogue there. So this is what's happening uh, at the moment. But it will continue, let me say, it will continue to be very, very polemical and problematic. Uh, I'm, Ron, I'm a PhD student in chemistry. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, we do a lot of important work in the field of land proliferation, and uh, most of it stems from the land proliferation treaty. Yeah. But there are a few countries who are nuclear countries that are not signatory of the yeah. treaties. So, how do you see uh, the IEA's role in avoiding or dealing with the proliferation and the nuclear capabilities of uh, countries uh, like that? Um, specifically, like, uh, what, what do you have in mind, for example, which country? Uh, Pakistan, India, uh, Israel, North Korea, uh, mainly. That uh, specifically, I think in the case of Pakistan, there is uh, some concern of uh, some technology or uh, knowledge uh, that could uh, get into the wrong hands in mm -hmm. some cases. And so I was wondering what is uh, the IAA's uh, 
capability in dealing with countries like that. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned the countries that chose not to join the non-proliferation treaty because they wanted nuclear weapons. Simply said. Uh, they, they were keeping the option open when they didn't join. First, for example, in the case of the subcontinent. And then they took the step. Uh, so uh, I don't see any uh, nuclear weapon state or nuclear weapon possessor state because they are uh, not uh, uh, among the five which are legitimate owners uh, of nuclear weapons under the condition that they work towards disarmament. Let's never forget that, although that is not happening, unfortunately. Um, but these countries decided to exercise the option to, to, to be nuclear, and this is the case of Israel at the same time. Hmm? Although they will not confirm it or deny it, we know that this is the case, and we can say it in this academic circle. Um, and others are trying, or have tried. So this is the question. In the case of Syria, there was a reactor that was being built and was bombed back in 2007. And it was the case of Iraq. And then, of course, uh, it could have been the case of Libya as well. In, in this case, you are mentioning Pakistan and, and India. and, and what I would say is that when it comes to these countries, there, there are still some things that, that we do in the sense that, uh, for example, when it comes to uh, nuclear security and nuclear safety, we, uh, we do a lot of work or try to do a lot of work in these countries. It's like uh, these countries, I'm oversimplifying, okay, but they got what they wanted. Uh, which is the nuclear weapons, and, and we all prefer that this step have not been taken, of course, but it's a reality. Um, but there are still areas where they work with the, with the IEA. And I think, and I, I make an effort, you know, I was in Pakistan, I'm going to India very soon. I try to be as present as I can. Of course, this, this line once crossed, unfortunately, is rarely, if ever, uh, you know, uh, rever reverted. So that'll be my answer. Can I see if there anybody who hasn't yet asked a question before I come back for a second opportunity? Anybody new who hasn't had a chance? Okay, back I go. To number one and number two. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the uh, Saudi Arabia situation? Mm -hmm. Well. Saudi Arabia uh, has uh, indicated that they are willing to embark in a very ambitious uh, nuclear power program. And uh, this has been you know, raising some eyebrows in many parts of the, of the world. And what, what I have been saying, and I, I'll be, uh, I hope I'll be in, in Riyadh soon, uh, I have told them that uh, this is fine, but they have to work with the IEA. So we are going to work with them, um, uh, of course, treating them as a sovereign state that has a sovereign right to, to do this, but they have to open their program to IEA inspections, ideally in the most comprehensive uh, way uh, possible. Again, another question, maybe off the sort of hot nuclear arms sort of topic. Yes. Um, what do you view as the best opportunities for the promotion of nuclear technology in the future? Or countries, regions which maybe haven't had experience with developing nuclear technology, things like that, maybe a yes. more optimistic outlook. Well, you know, there is, as I was saying in the introductory remarks, there is a lot of interest in nuclear energy. Why is this? As I was saying, in some cases, because countries. Um, like the big, big polluters know that in order to be in line with the climate change goals, they are never going to get there with renewals only. It's impossible. So they need baseline um, clean energy if possible. And nuclear is uh, together with hydro uh, and perhaps uh, um, hydrogen future uh, and very interesting. In, in, 
uh, with the difference compared with the others is that nuclear is there, mature technology, dispatchable, reliable, you have vendors, you know where you go if you want one react. So, uh, so that, is, that is one thing. And then, uh, then there is a palette, I would say, of options. There are countries that are only interested in, in what you could call traditional nuclear, okay? Having big reactors. Egypt, Turkey, Bangladesh, uh, are, they want the big thing. The United Arab Emirates, which did it. Hmm? Four uh, incredibly performant reactors in the desert, boom, in seven years, for those who say that nuclear is too slow, built by the Koreans, by the South Koreans, after a dramatic bid against France. They won, they did it. Uh, now Saudi, they're talking about 10 plus reactors. Uh, a very, very, very ambitious uh, idea, but they have the money and they may be able to, uh, to do it. We'll see, I will be following that. But there is also, and this is where, uh, you know, as, as, as DG, I received many, and next week I have the general conference of the IEA, uh, and it's typical that I see ministers of energy for many, many developing countries that, of course, are very excited about small modular reactors. Because the reality is that if you are a relatively small country uh, with a small modular reactors, 200 megawatts, you are powering half of your country, half of your nation. So, of course, there is such an intense interest. And these are reactors that you can get for uh, 800 million, 700 million, not 7 billion, 8 billion, 10 billion. So the, it, it is potentially a game changer. Hence, the, uh, the interest, in particular here in the United States, uh, there are many, many projects, New Scale, uh, uh, TerraPower, Bill Gates is putting a lot of money in this and others uh, that, that see the, 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 the attraction of this, the interest in this. Uh, fusion, fusion was always a, a distant thing. There are, there are certain plans to have demonstration fusion in five, six years. So who knows, maybe in 10 years, 15 years, you may be having fusion uh, reactors producing energy. So um, there are lots of possibilities. Of course, not all of them will be realized or will materialize. But what we see is an upward curve. I don't want to sound too uh, optimistic. I don't think nuclear will be at the height it will be required. But there will be a marked increase in the, in the percentages of nuclear energy which we have now. And in the United States, there might not be more, but there will be massive fleet replacement. So that is going to, to energize that industry. And, I, and we see people preparing for that as well. Yes. Um, I'm Tobias. I'm a physics student from Germany. I'm currently visiting in the CCD department. Um, my question is, what if, um, it kind of follows up on the um, Japan disposing um, water. Do you see um, a trajectory for the IEA um, that it could be a role model for other countries that have issues with um, storage of nuclear waste, for example, that you could go in as IEA and let's say you could, for example, Germany is currently like go there and shut, no, shut no. I mean, go there and like give um, advice on how to store nuclear waste um, because there is a similar issue uh, of the population living around there being scared of pollution and. Um, absolutely, not absolutely. The answer is absolutely. It should be. I think what we are seeing is, is a very interesting evolution. Um, had you asked, uh, or w let me put it in a different way, w should the IEA, would the IEA asked to do this? The answer would have been no. Because the normal reaction from member states is very conservative. Like we were saying, it's my, 
country is my responsibility, so go away. Hmm? So this happens a lot. There is a lot of uh, um, conservatism in this sense. But what is happening now, I think, could be the harbinger of new trends, new things happening. When you see a country which is technologically as mature as Japan, Japan doesn't need me to do any of this. They can dispose of this water perfectly safely without anybody. But there are these societal concerns. And we talk in nuclear, you know, we talk about a lot about license and social license. Social license is very important, apart, apart from the, what the NRC could be doing in the United States uh, or the, the, the German regulator, which is very strong, a very serious regulator. There are cases, and this happens in societies, where people would like to have a, an inter, the international organization, especially when it is a prestigious scientific international organization, giving advice or having a say. Of course, this has to be done by invitation. But my impression is that after seeing what happened with Fukushima, after seeing Saporizia, what is happening there, where, where the IEA can step in and, and, and play a useful role, like an honest broker, which is not taking sides. Hmm? Uh, I can foresee an interesting uh, development. Um, but as, as I was saying, had you, had you proposed this uh, preemptively or preventively or uh, before the curve, you would have been a, a, a no. Uh, there, there had been some discussions about nuclear safety inspections, like the ones we have for safeguards. And the reactions were very negative. Well, actually, this is what we are doing now in Japan. We don't call it an inspection. Perhaps it's too hot a word. But we are there. We check. And uh, on Monday, I signed <coughs> an agreement with the, with the Japanese foreign minister where she and I uh, agreed on a long-term process, etc. And it is, of course, foreseen that if we see something that we don't like, we are going to say it. We, I don't have the power to stop it, but if the IEA says this is not working, you can be sure that there will be such a, you know, a, an uproar. <laughs> and the Japanese society is very, uh, mind you, I've been to Fukushima many times I go, and, and I meet with a fisherman association, and chamber of commerce, and people without the government. And I asked the government, go away. Leave me alone with these people to discuss with them what they are concerned. And they don't like it either. They, they, they sound like the Chinese. They say, no, oh, this is a scandal, of course, because it's their living, this, their, their livelihoods. And who is going to want to, to eat the, the Fukushima fish? And Fukushima is a, is a more than fish is an agricultural region. They do fantastic tomatoes and, and, and rice and all of that. There's a good, very good food from, uh, from the Fukushima prefecture. So for them, uh, this was important. So I think, to your question, I think we could see the, 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 the beginning of a, of a trend, but we will see. I don't want to lose any more people, and I want to give you a chance to maybe talk to people afterwards a little bit if they want to ask more questions. Yeah. So, let me give you a chance to make maybe a couple of closing remarks. Well, no, just to say that uh, we, we are seeing change. So follow the change. Because uh, in, the, in the current configuration of things, when it comes to energy, when it comes to climate change and the environment, um, uh, good old nuclear energy or nuclear science and technology, which is different, uh, has a very, very important uh, role to play. As I was saying also in cancer, in, in food security, in, in all these things, uh, nuclear science and applications and technologies have a very, very important role to play. And the IEA, I think, is a formidable instrument. You know, this year, and I will be uh, celebrating that. This year is the 70, 70 years of the Adams for Peace. Famous speech of President Eisenhower 
at the, at the United Nations in December. Uh, and I uh, invited his uh, granddaughter uh, to come to, to Vienna to, to think about that and to commemorate that. And I think this uh, noble idea of Arms for Peace is, is worth, uh, worthy of, uh, I would say, celebration and more than celebration for you, your, your generation, and those who will be coming um, uh, after you. So it's been a pleasure. Uh, come to Vienna. Come visit us uh, whenever you want. And uh, okay. thank you very much. Thank you, General. Thank you very much for spending time with us. Thank you very much.